Lots going on in the news this week. Joining us now, actor and activist Tatiana Ali, political activist Jeff Johnson, founder of UrbanCusp.com, Washington Post contributor Raheel Tesfamarium, and political journalist and the Griot.com contributor Joe Williams. All right, folks, I want to get right into it. Uh, very interesting, very interesting this week uh, to sit here and listen to Mitt Romney make his comments. And normally we go right into our panel and then we do the biggest damn lie later in the week. But right now, we're going to do it off the top. All right, the political news this week was dominated by the release of a secret recorded videotape Mitt Romney took at a fundraiser. Uh, which was quite interesting. Uh, and he insulted nearly half the electorate. Most folks probably have seen it. He is insulting basically half of the country and said, you're voting for President Obama, you're a moocher. Your reaction to it? Um, there are a lot of things that are wrong with what Romney said, but for me, just as a, a citizen of this country, for somebody seeking to be leader, of this country, to be the president, to say that half of the country just doesn't matter, he's not even going to worry about them at all, I think is pretty amazing. Because you're supposed to be the president for everybody, right? Making, well, you, well, you would want to be, you would think. I would think that that would matter, so I find that just appalling, just on the, the, the base level, for me as a, as a voter. So I kept wondering who he was talking about specifically. Now, he talked about 47%, and it was a setting where there were a lot of people who didn't necessarily consider themselves part of that 47%. But it almost sounded like another, another episode of Code. It almost sounded like, well, you know, those people. But the problem is that that broad swath of people gets divided up into, like, retirees, the military, you know, all kinds of people. Who a lot to... of Rip Mitt Romney supporters are in that 47%. Absolutely. But it sounded like from the tone of his remark that he was trying to get a message. Now, exactly what that message was, nobody ever called him out on that and asked him specifically who he was talking about because it was so broad. But I'm kind of interested in whether or not that was another example of Mitt Romney being himself in people who were like him, or if it was something like he was trying to send a message to people to try to get them to open their wallets. Is it even truthful that 47% of the United States does not pay income no. tax? That's yeah, not I mean, well, here's the, deal. here's the deal. You have the stats where 47% of the country doesn't pay federal income tax, but they are paying payroll taxes. Also, you have tax credits that have been created for earned income tax credit. You have uh, mortgage tax credits that middle class folks also use. Half of the 47%, to Joe's point, are seniors, okay? And what really jumps out when you look at that is that many of these tax credits were signed into law by Republican presidents because they were trying to push through big tax cuts like President Ronald Reagan. I don't think we should get so into the percentage that we forget the other terminology that he used. Um, and the terminology was rooted in dependency. When you talk about health care, housing, it, it strikes images of, of a welfare system. And well, to me- Because he said, they consider themselves victims, victims and they don't believe in personal responsibility. Absolutely, and this is usually code word for people of color, um, minority groups, immigrant groups, people who are dependent on the government for their support, for their prosperity, um, people who look like us, essentially. So it's raci racialized language, and I think the percentage um, was safe because he didn't have to get into the details of it, right? But he's ultimately talking about um, people who don't look like him, who don't look like the white rich donors that were in that space. And he got very comfortable, and I think in that comfortable space, he said things that we would never hear if he was on the campaign trail. And I, I really wonder, you know, do we understand what it means when he can say those things to wealthy supporters and, and would refuse to, to admit to that as, as how he really feels. You know, it's, it's not mere politics. This is how he essentially feels. I don't, I don't think he knows how he feels. <laughs> uh, and, and I think at the, at the end of the day, we have seen Mitt Romney in multiple scenarios for the last two decades say whatever is necessary in any right. place at any time. And so I'm, I'm not surprised by it. I'm not even offended. What I'm offended by is that he's even running for president. Mm. And, and what I'm offended by is the fact that you have somebody who clearly has no character that has the possibility of being president. The, the fact that I'm going around the country 
trying to get people excited to beat Mitt Romney is offensive. And so that's, that's what I'm offended by. I, I think that, that, that we need to continue to push this 47% because I think it's an indication, regardless of who he's talking about, that he's disconnected from the vast majority of American people regardless of party. And that alone makes him ineligible to be the best president that we need, at, not just during this time, but any time. One of the things that jumps out is that we've seen folks... We've seen this gleeful reaction from supporters of the president, and I've heard people literally say the election is over. We've seen battleground polls showing the president is up in Ohio, in Virginia, uh, neck and neck in Florida, also up in Colorado. Uh, but the reality is, if you remember 2008, that election was tight all the way through the middle of October until Senator McCain suspended his campaign uh, when it came to the debt crisis. That's when then Senator Obama really began to pull away. And so I don't get people who are on the left who say this campaign is over. I think they're crazy because we don't know what the impact is going to be with these voter suppression laws uh, and also what happens when the Romney super PACs start dropping Two hundred million dollars on ads. The, the other, the other reality is that we we forget that the GOP will vote no matter what. You you could put a rat and a roach as VP and presidential nominees <laughs> with a GOP T-shirt on, and they would turn out because they don't like President Obama. No, well, and, and 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 they turn out. I think the concern that there's two things. There was a huge bump at least from an excitement level from the DNC. From the convention. And so, yes, right. and so there were a number of people that got excited. Secondly, we began to see these numbers that I don't think we expected this early that was showing the president ahead in some key battleground states. I was almost horrified by that because I know what that does for some of us in particular is it says President Obama got it. And, and on November 6th, if it rains, they like, oh, it's good. I don't need to go out. Um, and so we, we cannot stop, we cannot rest, we cannot lay back on our laurels. We cannot think that he has it. I don't care if, if Romney blunders the next 49 days. We need to push and push and push because at the end of the day, we have to make, I, I want to see the president win by so many votes that it's absurd. And if that happens, then fantastic. But we have to make up for the potential ground that's going to be lost by voter disenfranchisement, by confusion, by laziness, and by miscommunication. How critical will the three presidential debates be to determine what happens on Election Day? Because remember, early voting will be taking place during that period. I think it's going to be pretty crit critical because Mitt Romney gets two, three more chances to try to right the wrong. In front and of a national audience. In front of a national audience. And keep in mind, to Jeff's point, we've already had at least half a dozen gaffes that probably would have sunk a lesser candidate, that probably would have sunk a lesser candidate in different times. But because Mo Romney has this raft of money that he can rely on, and because we've got a lot of disenfranchisement going on, we've also got a lot of subterfuge, a lot of people really suspicious of voting a second time for President Obama, that has allowed him to stay afloat. So he can make his mark in the debates without really having to define his candidacy to this point, which he hasn't really done so far. Well, I, I want to make the point. I think voter suppression is something we often talk about, but there's something that happens um, through the leadership uh, of you know, various communities, communities um, of faith, for example, where you have pastors who have said they're not going to vote in this election because they can't choose between a Mormon and a president that supports same-sex marriage. Um, so what I am really concerned about are influential people who offer spiritual revelation to people who kind of speak as God's mouthpiece, as well as, you know, the, the debate that you've been having on, on Twitter over Lupe Fiasco and rappers. And, and so people who have influence in the decisions that people make, le leaving a sense of apathy in people because they say, why vote? I'm, I'm essentially choosing the less of two evils. And I think it's absolutely irresponsible mm -hmm. for leaders who have their own platforms, who can reach out to millions of people, say, well, on that day, why don't you be silent? Talk down. Um, I absolutely uh, uh, agree with what you're saying, and it's something that I talk about with my family all the time. This, that in particular, but there's also it's like you want to say something but you trying to like I don't really no, go because, there. well this is this is a conversation that that is being had all over the place in our living rooms and, and it's happening in my living room all the time too but one one reason that we can't 
kind of stop our pace and, and why we have to keep it moving forward is that there's a really large group of voters who don't really pay attention until the very end. So all this stuff that we think is so outlandish mm -hmm. that is, oh my goodness, people's minds have to be made up now. Now they really know who Romney is. Now they really can see the difference. That's not even in their frame of reference. Um, and so we can't, we can't let that time, we can't let that window pass. Roland, but, and, and to that point, there's also a segment of our population that the campaign's not going to. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they're just not. For whatever reason, they're not going. I, I'm just, I just became communication director for a new super PAC um, called Black Men Vote. And we're targeting 18 to 34 year old black men in Ohio and Virginia. Because we know at the end of the day, those two states in particular can have a huge impact on the overall electoral count. I know that there are places that, that the president's campaign is not going. And so I want to go with messages and individuals. I want to go to strip clubs. I want to go to bars. I want to go to transit areas. I want to go to housing complexes. I want to go to the places. You better not start. I want to go to the places that the campaign. Absolutely. I want, I want two chains to go into the strip club and say, if you ball enough to make it rain, you ball enough to vote. I, I don't care what it is. That, that's what I'm looking for, because the, to, to Tatiana's point, there's a whole generation of young people who care about stuff that's going on, but they're never engaged right. to be a part of the process, and we got to do that. I, I do want to do one thing, right here. You brought that story up, and I know we're almost out of time. Let me be real clear. The Associated Press ran a story right. that said that these black pastors are urging their congregations not to vote. Right. That story is actually a lie. Okay, I have a piece on, it's on my website right now. First of all, if you read that piece, first of all, and I went to the AP, the, head, the original headline was changed to reflect that. In that story, there wasn't a single pastor quoted saying they were telling their congregation not to vote. Now, there were a couple in the story that said they were conflicted, uh, they were making a decision. One said he was going to go fishing on election day. But first of all, a pastor cannot tell their congregation not to vote for a candidate because they are in violation of their 501c3 status. And so I reached out to the AP and I said, wait a minute, how did you run this story? Uh, how did you put it out there and you're intimating that's the case when it's not? Because the headline said uh, Christians are wavering in their vote. The last poll taken showed that black folks are going to vote about 94% for President Barack Obama. There are a lot of Christians in that 94%. So, uh, so, uh, so AP said, we stand by our story. I made it clear, Associated Press, your story was wrong. And people out there, you're tweeting that story, you're passing it around. I, look, I checked it. The story's a flat-out lie. So somebody need to go ahead and say it, and that's the whole point there. So Talk to, here, here, real quick. Just real quickly, uh, Maryland, last election, dirty tricks were all over the place. They, they had people calling saying, we got it, don't worry. Democratic households, black households, don't vote. It's The margin's over. You know, the, the, the vote is too big. Your vote is not going to make a difference. I'll tell you about it. Ignore all of that because until the last vote is counted, you don't know what's going to happen. Tatiana, Jeff, Raheel, Joe, we appreciate it. I'm out of time. <laughs> Folks, that is it for this special edition of TV once Washington Watch from the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's 42nd Annual Legislative Conference. We also want to thank Impact for partnering with us to bring you this very important discussion. Be sure to tune in again next week at 11 a.m. Eastern for another edition of TV One's Washington Watch. Until then, I'm Roland Martin. Goodbye and have a blessed week.